Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation Elephant Professional Lecture. Um, this one, uh, in we were going to take you all the way to uh, all the way to Zimbabwe and talk about lots of my favourite subjects. Um, uh, as you know, um, we're very interested in the way elephants are trained and can be trained. Uh, we're very interested in elephant here in the, on the lecture series. We're very interested in elephant camp standards and standards of welfare and how they can uh, how they can be used to improve the welfare of elephants. Um, and we're very interested in elephants in general and behavioural observations. And from the title of Jake's talk, um, he will cover all three of those things. Um, there's things that we are working on with a lot of partners, and those of you who are following the series will will know and will have seen previous lectures with a lot of partners are working on in Asia and. Um, it's great to know that there's parallel work going on in, in Africa to, to work with the other species of elephants, the, the larger, the larger, more tusky speech, species of elephant. Um, and we will uh, and we will learn more about these things. Um, I will hand you over without further ado to, to Jake Rendell Wind, who will tell you all about what he's doing and how he's doing. Hi, Jake. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, I'm going to just go into it. I'll just share my screen so that you can see my slides. Um, so, uh, um, uh, as John introduced me, I'm, I'm uh, Jake Rendell Worthington. I'm, um, I'm director at a charity called We're All Mammals, which is a registered charity in the UK, um, and I'm also project leader at ZWACT, which is a Zimbabwean-based trust um, called uh, Zambezi Elephant Welfare and Conservation Trust, um, which is set up, was set up to look after um, some elephants that um, uh, had previously been owned by a tourism company. So more broadly, who I am is an animal psychologist uh, or an animal behavior specialist um, and I've lived and worked and studied with animals all my life, having grown up on my parents' experimental ecological farms in Scotland, England, and France. I was uh, very fortunate from a young age to join my mother on um, many, of her, many of her work trips. This is her in the middle with the meerkat on her head. Uh, and an ethologist and animal welfare scientist. Uh, and I also was fortunate enough to have uh, a grandfather who was, a, who was a, an early conservationist. He was a freshwater ecologist and worked in East and Central Africa and was scientific director of what was known as the International Biological Programme. So my, I was very fortunate to have experience and a way into these worlds and this gave me increasing interest and connection between animal welfare and conservation. And that is how my life experience has, has affected me as an individual. So the first elephant individual that I met um, was called Toto. And this was, to this is Toto here. Um, he was a bull elephant. Um, we met him on a trip to Zimbabwe uh, with, uh, with my mother, who was asked to visit um, a game ranch called Amiri Game Park, um, which was in, set up by a hunter turned conservationist. Um, and he had come by a number of elephants because in Zimbabwe, in the 70s and 80s, there were lots of culling ex exercises and many of the small infant elephants um, were not culled in this exercise. Um, and the, many of these ended up in the hands of farmers and people with land. So Norman wanted us, or wanted my mother, to help him train and care for his elephants. Um, which I was fortunate enough to join this trip on. This became an ongoing relationship where we would visit Emiri and improve um, and develop teaching methods, handling and welfare 
of these elephants every year or so. And we actually ended up developing a manual for the elephant carers and ended up consulting for a number of other places that had elephants in similar situations uh, for similar reasons across Southern Africa. This training manual turned into a book uh, influenced by my mother's work studying cognition le and learning in a puppy, a foal, a calf and a young llama. So it's really applicable to mammals across the board. At the time she worked um, in the Department of Psychology at the University of Exeter and had a colleague who was a developmental psychologist there. He was doing work on teaching language comprehension to children who were then judged to be gifted children by the time they reached primary school age. He found that taking children on expeditions, naming objects in a simple and clear way, then testing to see what they comprehended using a simple sentence structure at, three, at nine months old would lead them to being gifted when they started school. And this is, a, my mother then applied this similar approach on the puppy, the foal and the calf and the young llama um, and to see how their language comprehension would develop. Could they understand simple words and basic sentence structure or basic commands. This approach um, to developmental psychology with a good understanding of learning theory and lots of practical experience with a variety of mammals led to what we call cooperative teaching. So as we developed the cooperative teaching with the, with the guys in Africa, we boiled down these scientific theories and knowledge in a way to make it more accessible to elephant carers um, who worked in Zimbabwe and other Southern African countries. The, these guys are actually in South Africa and um, this, was, uh, this was a cooperative teaching course I did for, for um, Adventures with Elephants, um, which uh, is run by Sean Hensman. Um, these guys are generally selected from poor backgrounds, they're agricultural workers and such like, and so generally have had fairly little access to education. Um, many, however, and I would say most are, are quite intelligent, capable and have huge skill and depth of understanding of the elephants they live and work with, mainly because they spend most of their lives with them. Uh, I think this is um, a bit different to Asia, where there's quite a deeply ingrained culture spanning thousands of years in terms of working with and teaching elephants. Um, and some not so pleasant practices. Um, in Africa, yes, there's a variety of points over millennia where African elephants had been trained, but this hadn't really resulted in an ingrained culture as in Asia. For, so for us, this was, a, this was a great opportunity, a blank canvas to introduce humane and scientifically based knowledge and techniques from the start. So how do you start teaching an elephant? Well, the first thing, um, and I'm not gonna go into specifics here, this isn't a manual for you to start, go out and start teaching your own elephant, but I, it's, I wanna get some concepts across which help your thinking in order to um, work with elephants and other mammals. So the first thing you really need to understand is that all mammals are individuals. They have personalities. They have different lifetime experiences, express different preferences and react to different stimuli in different ways. Just like Toto here. So Toto, one of the things um, you had to be very aware of with Toto's was that he was a blind in, in his left eye, which meant that approaching from the left was often a nervy experience from him because he couldn't see you until you were right on the right side of his um, vision. So he also came from a culling operation. So um, that, that had implications for types of people that worked with him as well. So you have to be aware of that. Um, so people often say, all oh, animals, they are unpredictable. But 
I'm sure many of you uh, viewing this may have a pet cat or dog or, or other animal. And I'm sure you spend lots of time with that dog or cat or, or whatever that animal may be. And I want you to think about how predictable you think that animal is. Are they predictable or unpredictable? And what about the people you spend time with? Are they predictable or unpredictable? I'm not talking about general, any person, I'm just talking about the people you know well. I'm sure in general, you would say they're fairly predictable. And why is this? It's because we put time into understanding those other humans and animals as individuals. And don't just broad brush them as a breed, species or of a different culture. We need to understand other animals as other individual persons. So how on earth do we begin to understand other animals as individuals? Well, um, I, I like to use an, what I call um, a method of conditional anthropomorphism. Um, anthropomorphism is to shape other animals and their experience into human form to project your human emotions and thoughts and ideas onto that animal. And it's traditionally a very dirty word for scientists, particularly. You know, there's some who won't even name their animal subjects um, because they think it's anthropomorphizing and they'll give them you know, titles such as IG-55 and WF-21. But, you know, we simply cannot get away from the fact that as humans, our entire experience is of inner experiences of us. And so we inevitably anthropomorphize about everything. And even the most subjective scientists ask particular questions, investigate in particular ways that are not 100% objective. So we really need to understand this as a starting point for understanding others. We anthropomorphize to understand the world. And this can be helpful to a degree. I have a similar structural physiology as an elephant for understanding the world. Uh, I have a brain connected to a brain stem or spinal cord, connected to nerves, and those are connected to various sensory receptors. This gives me a sense of sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch all subjectively experienced and processed in the brain with many of the similar features between human and elephant brains. So then you need to, once if you've accepted there are these similarities, you need to then start putting conditions on, on those similarities that are relevant. For instance, an elephant's auditory range is estimated between 10 kilohertz and 10 hertz. This crosses over with my auditory range, which goes as low as about 30 hertz, so not as low as an elephant's. But there's a significant shared range, and that is this um, lighter shaded region in the middle of this diagram here. Another condition that we can apply, particularly to elephants, is that they have a much larger cerebellum proportionally to humans of total brain volume. So in, a, in an elephant, it's between 18 and 19%. In a human, it's about 10%. Now, what the cerebellum is primarily involved in is um, receiving information about and regulating motor movements. So how I move my hands and fingers and how an elephant moves their trunk. Now, this makes particular you know, this difference in proportion makes particular um, sense when you think about the elephant's trunk. It's got 40,000 muscles in it. For perspective, I've got about five or six or 700 muscles in my whole body. So that's uh, 50 times as many muscles just in an elephant's trunk that they have to know how to control. It's a lot of muscles to control. And as humans, we like to think of ourselves as great manipulators of the world, but spend some time just watching an elephant's trunk 
and you will be left in awe of how he can manipulate things. This means much of their life experience is to do with movement and manipulation. They need physical stimulation and they need, um, they need physical stimulation to satisfy that capacity. Another, briefly, another, another way in which we're similar but there is conditions to, to apply is our visual fields. Now an elephant has his ear, eyes on the sides of his head, unlike us who have the eyes on our fronts of our head. So an elephant's eyes are looking this way. That means it's got a much wider visual field, but there's a big blind spot. There's a bit of a blind spot behind them, unlike us where there's a big blind spot, but there's also a, a blind spot right in front of them because their eyes are situated right around to the size of the head. So when it comes to being getting up close to an elephant, it's really important that you understand that, that you don't walk straight up to an elephant right into their blind spot because again they won't be able to see you and they won't know what you're doing and they that may unnerve them so it's really by knowing ourselves and understanding the differences we have with other species that we can begin to get a notion of their subjective experience or private thoughts so the single uh, the big thing, you know, as an animal psychologist that I want to do is help people how to know how to teach and care for their animals better. And the single biggest issue when it comes to teaching of other animals or problem animals is that you have to get to the person who's got that problem or wants to teach. And you have to get that person to understand why the animal they're trying to teach doesn't know what they want them to do. And I think this is an issue that comes up, um, has come up in a number of other of these lectures with this series. Um, it's highlighted by uh, Andrew McLean and, and Gerardo Martinez. So how can we get over that problem? How can we get people to understand how the animal is understanding the situation and, how, and what they want the animal to understand about the situation to get the animal to do something. So we can do this through conditional anthropomorphizing, understanding the subject's experience, and then you can work out what kind of stimuli or cues the animal will respond to. We can then provide the mo motivation that they're gonna respond to. Um, and this is usually, uh, reinforcing through food, voice, or a pat in the right place. Um, and um, this is basically fits into the basic learning paradigm or, or conditioning. So you have stimulus, you need to know what stimulus is gonna work. Um, and you need to know what stimulus you want to be using. So we really teach the use of voice and that's where, um, going through teaching, saying words, uh, simple words over and over and over again helps. You know, elephants can hear our voice. Let's use that. Then the response the animal gives or the elephant gives, and then reinforcement. And make sure you're giving the appropriate type of re reinforcement in the appropriate manner. You know, there is positive and there's negative reinforcement. And both can be used badly and both can be used well. And just for the record, negative reinforcement is not necessarily hitting an elephant. That's punishment and that is not helpful. Um, but a, one form of negative reinforcement that can be used is your attention. So if you're in a teaching situation and the elephant is doing something you don't want them to do, such as swinging their trunk at you, what I do is I just turn around and look the other way and wait until their elephant has stopped doing that. That's negative reinforcement because what I've done is I've taken away my attention and that's why it's called negative reinforcement. So understanding the, uh, the animal's perspective, working through the use of words and using the basic um, learning paradigm or conditioning really does facilitate communication with the animal and learning. Now conditional 
uh, anthropomorphism also helps us understand welfare. Not only can you get a notion of the subjective sensory experience and cognition of other animals through conditionally anthropomorphizing, we can use our own inner mental world as a stepping stone to access their mood and their emotions. Another current concept in animal welfare science is, is the five domains model. And I know this has come up in, in some of the other lectures of this series, which takes account of mental state. So this approach of understanding elephants helps us measure their overall welfare across the board. We can understand the impacts of what we do across all areas and then infer how all of this affects their overall subjective experience or mental state, the, the fifth um, domain in the five domains model here. We can also understand those earlier four domains by looking at various physiological and behavioral manifestations. Um, and physiological manifestations might include heart rate, corticosteroids, uh, weeping temporal gland uh, in elephants, um, which, which shows heightened emotional state. Um, and this all, this all helps us get a fuller understanding of, of the welfare of an elephant. So as France Wall, an ethologist, um, says, the conscious subjective experience of emotions is what we're ultimately concerned with when we consider human and animal welfare. So coming back to cooperative teaching, um, I just briefly want to explain to you the central guidance. Um, and we turned many of the concepts we found useful um, and the crossover with, with many of other, other good um, uh, teachers, animal teachers in this in this uh, uh, in this area, into an acronym. So cooperative teaching is a caress, where A stands for anxiety. If you're going into any situation with an animal, you want to reduce the anxiety of the animal and yourself. Um, reduce the fear. Make sure everybody's calm. Consistency, you've got to be consistent with another animal in your behavior. You know, this is how trust is built. Trust is built between people that are consistent with one another. And that same is true with animals. You must always use the same words. You must react to them in the same ways. Um, and that will help you build that confidence and trust which leads to mutual respect attention um, if you're working closely with an animal you must always have 100 percent of your attention on that animal and ensure that animal has attention on you reinforcement uh, again use reinforcement appropriately there's positive and there's negative reinforcement and they must be used appropriately and, and as I said before, punishment, which is not included in reinforcement, is not helpful. Um, to me, there are three things to focus on when it comes to reinforcement. There's the type of reinforcement. Is it food? Is it voice? I praise. Is it, um, is it a gesture? Is it a pat in a place that they like being touched? Um, with, with elephants, we often find some individuals, and this is, again, it's not the same for every single individual, um, a rub on their chest um, is, is, is quite a good reinforcement, and they like it, and, and you often get a rumble out of them. Um, so there's type, there's timing. You've got to make sure you time that reinforcement right on the moment that tells the animal or the elephant Yes, I've done the right thing. Um, and then there's the volume of, of the reinforcement. Now, if you're using food rewards, over time, you really want to reduce the amount of food reward that's necessary to elicit uh, the behavior you're after. Um, 
And with voice, it can be very useful as well, because as they start to do the right, the right behavior, as they make movements going in that right direction, you can begin to you sort of go, yes, yes, good boy. And as they do the right thing, they get to the right thing, you go, yes, good boy, well done. Clap can be, can be reinforcement. They know that they've done the right thing. Um, then there's enjoyment. I mean, it's got to be enjoyable. Don't bother doing it if it's not enjoyable. That's the best thing my worst boss ever told me. Um, it, it really does need to be enjoyable for you and the elephant. Um, and we particularly ensure that any teaching session is kept quite short. It's no more than 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. So, so that they don't get bored in the teaching situation. You know, I, I did a, my undergraduate degree is in psychology, and I remember sitting through an hour and a half lecture um, in which we were told that human attention lasts 45 minutes. So go figure. Um, then there's simplicity. So alongside consistency, if you're sim simple with your words, that will help build trust and help build understanding. Simple words repeated um, and um, always use in the same situation and, con and consistently about the same um, object um, that, that, the, that the word applies to or concept. And then finally, obviously, safety. You know, it's got to be safe. Um, that is a very important thing. Don't never go into a situation with an animal that you don't think is safe. Just avoid it. It's going to be a bad outcome. N you know, not just from safety terms, but also from psychological terms. The animals aren't going to trust the situation or you or, or, or whatever. I, you know, and um, it's got to be safe for you. It's got to be safe for the animal. It's got to be safe for everybody around you as well. So this, that's a sort of brief skip over the, the central guidance in cooperative teaching. And um, as I said, we always start um, the day with the elephants here with a, with a teaching and handling session. So we do actually do handling just before we do teaching. And this is, this is again where the educational psychology comes in. Handling is about um, the carer getting up close to the elephant and just touching them, getting them happy with their getting them happy with their presence and how they, um, how they work with them, building that mutual trust um, and using words, touching their leg and saying, this is your left leg, this is your left leg, touching their bottom, saying, this is your bottom, this is your bottom, touching their trunk, saying, this is your trunk, this is your trunk, touching their tusk and saying, this is your tusk, this is your tusk, touching their ear, saying, this is your ear. This is your ear. Um, and maybe even naming other objects. Now, this is, this is really important, A, from a perspective of them building a, uh, an auditory vocabulary that's going to be useful in so many ways. Um, but it also gives an opportunity for the, for the carer just to give a sort of a good check over the, the elephant every morning, see if they've got any ailments, lumps or bumps or bruises, are they shying away from a particular area? Um, is there, has something happened overnight which, which, which needs attention? Uh, have they got a wound that's getting better? Um, and also about developing that bond of mutual respect with the carer, um, becoming comfortable and confident in his or her presence. These words of can then be formed into central sentences when teaching and can advance to sequences that, that can be quite complex. So the next question is, well, why should we teach elephants at all? Um, can't we just leave them be? Um, so I think with elephants that are in human care, the, rep the restrictions that are placed on them um, by the limitations of the of the captive environment necessitate a need for mental extra mental sti stimulation um, as they will not be facing the day-to-day -day challenges or they shouldn't be facing the day-to-day -day challenges that they would be in the wild from finding food foraging to finding water uh, to 
running away from external threats um, to dealing with disease and 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 pain without um, without veterinary attention um, and human interaction can be a means of fulfilling that need if it's if it's done appropriately um, so the duty of care that captivity entails in the provision of veterinary care, supplementary feeding, social interaction requires management and human interaction and teaching of, and handling of elephants can make the ability to provide these things much less stressful and better managed um, and therefore better for welfare. Um, this video is just of, of, of uh, two of our elephants in a, in a nighttime enclosure just being given a bit of a puzzle feeder um, and you can see the elephants are very relaxed they're used to those guys and they're just um, they're just waiting for for the point at which to have a play with the tire um, uh, and uh, as you may have also noticed we don't we don't use um, ankuses um, anymore here or or um, or tether the elephants um, unless there's a emergency reason to do so. Um, so th there's also other justifications for keeping elephants in human care beyond being for their own good and uh, uh, and I can get on to one of those big reasons being for their own good later but um, this includes research, education and um, the and obviously predominantly these days with many elephants in human care, it's for tourism. And for all of these things, a humanely well-taught elephant is much safer, shows more positive welfare indicators and can facil facilitate much greater advances for tourism, education and research. Um, now, the other thing is one enjoyment. One so done with right. consciousness, the elephants need preferences preferences and desires and mind, teaching can lead to a much happier elephant that enjoys human contact that it's inevitably gonna have and cooperating in mutually beneficial pursuits. Now, I, I, I also feel personally that it, it's very unfair to keep an elephant uh, that lives in human care and not give them the opportunity to develop a relationship with their human carers in, in a way that is safe, provides for you, mental stimulation and emotional needs and leads to an overall high quality of life. So you can see here, this is, this is giving some basic medical treatment uh, to Laduma. Giving him treatment every morning. So he's got quite a nasty wound there, but he's quite happily let our carers um, tend to it, clean it out, put some uh, put some medicine on there, and now he's finished the finished the procedure, and he's just getting up, and he's been given a, a, a nice food reward. So you can see that level of trust facilitates um, interventions which can uh, it, um, are quite extreme, can be quite extreme and, but they facilitate them in a really stressful free way. So, I mean, how do we know all this? So this is really down to the role of welfare science. And over the last 60 years, welfare science as its own discipline has, has developed hugely. A turning point in our relationship with other animals in scientific terms came in the 1960s with um, books such as Ruth Harrison's Animal Machines. Now, th that book was predominantly uh, about fa factory farming methods. And unfortunately, that is something which, you know, really needs to be addressed more in terms of animal welfare and, and, um, and, um, 
and and still blights the 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 soul of humanity, in my opinion. But um, broadly, we can put the evolution of concerns of animal welfare science like this. So in the early days, it was pretty much about the prevention of cruelty, um, and that's what those early texts in the 60s really focused on and the early science focused on. Um, then it moved on to the provision of needs. Do animals have all that they need in their, in their circumstances under human care? Um, and, and that was, I guess, most famously intimated by the five freedoms. So uh, concepts of food, comfort, health, and behavioral repertoire were, were introduced in that, in that provision of needs. I think um, where we are with much of the science now is, is towards a high quality of life for animals that are in human care. Um, that's being able to provide them not just with their needs, but an enjoyable, happy life where they, 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 they experience much of, much of the emotions and experiences and life experiences that, that they might in the wild. And hopefully without much, without the worst things of the wild, such as hunger, um, such as no veterinary care um, and uh, disease, uh, disease without treatment um, uh, and drought and uh, hunting. So where next? Well, I think um, there is a certain amount of science coming out now um, uh, and a lot of people thinking about the welfare of wild animals in wild environments. Um, and this sort of, this is very much kind of the space we are in here at ZWACT in that we have the elephants that we look after, but we also have wild elephants passing through. Um, and so we're kind of uniquely positioned to, to understand the welfare of wild elephants as well. Um, and I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on that and to, to, to propel forward conservation, really. So how do we assess welfare? Well, firstly, there's the health element, obviously, usually the role of veterinarians. Uh, if an animal in human care suffers from numerous health problems and needs continual veterinary care, often this is an indication that there is something beyond health reasons that is wrong. There's some management or behavioral issue. Secondly, physio physiological measures that can be looked at. Um, and this means analysis of things like glucocorticoid levels, which can be done through the saliva or dung, um, heart rate that can be monitored, um, body condition, uh, and with elephants as a five point scale and foot condition, which is a similar scale for elephants. Um, and thirdly, from my perspective, the easiest and most accessible way to understand really what's happening in the mind of, of um, an animal, um, that subjective consciousness is to, to look at their welfare through how, it, as it's demonstrated through the behavior of the animal. The animal is telling us something is wrong or they're telling us they're perfectly happy. We just need to understand and communicate with our elephants better to get to that point. And we can assess this by doing routine behavioral assessments, but also in more thoughtful scientific methods, uh, more thorough, sorry, scientific methods uh, of monitoring, such as using an ethogram or a list of behaviors and doing a full day of observation recording the behaviors that animal spends their time doing. So this gives time budgets, which can then be comparable between individuals and between uh, domestic and, and or, or wild animals. Um, and one of the things I think anybody that's spent much time with elephants will agree on is they spend a lot of time chewing and pooing. And so that's an important part of their day. So, the other, other thing that we can get to understand is we, under, we can identify behavioral indicators, both positive and negative. So negative ones would be high levels of aggressive or depressive behaviors. 
and in extreme cases, stereotypical behavior, repetitive behaviors that have no purpose performed obliviously to their surroundings. Positive ones would be um, play behaviors, social interaction behaviors, and the ability to perform all behaviors in the animal's repertoire. So what is really important is that we focus on the 24 hour life experience of the elephant. What does their full day involve? Not just a specific activity, because often those specific activities that some people like to focus on are really a very small proportion of that elephant's day um, and, and really don't tell us about the wider picture of what kind of life that elephant leads. So um, why are these elephants in human care in Southern Africa? And the history of elephant tourism is a relatively so short one in this part of the world. Um, and it all emanates really from a period in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, which I mentioned earlier, where there was a common management practice by wildlife authorities to um, cull wild herds, to get their numbers under control as they thought they needed to be. Now, this is very much generally considered not a useful, not a humane, nor an effective way to manage elephant populations. So it was also common practice to capture elephants from wilderness areas to manage their populations. And this was often done to provide revenue to wildlife authorities as they were then sold to um, uh, a variety of clients, um, both within country and externally. And those that were within country generally ended up in this um, elephant tourism um, area. Um, so for good or for worse, these reasons, um, depending on your opinion, um, these, these things still continue to happen. Not the culling so much, but certainly um, the capture of wild elephants for sale. Um, and this happens across Southern Africa because a lot of these countries' authorities see that they have done actually very well in, in conserving elephant populations. Um, and some people feel that there's overpopulations in certain areas. So this doing well at conserving these elephant populations also comes at a cost, however. And where I am based in the Kaza area, which is a huge, uh, trans frontier free roaming area for elephants in this part of the world. Uh, it spans Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, and, and Zimbabwe, where I'm based, that little star that is somewhere near the middle um, in Victoria Falls. Um, this is really the largest free roaming area. Um, and with the biggest population of elephants left in the world. There's almost 60% of African elephants in this area. Um, that's roughly 250,000 individuals. Um, and it's what I call the last great elephant range. Within this area, there's also 2 million people, um, which means there's a big frequency of conflict arising between people and elephants, with some areas within this um, region, anecdotally at least, losing more elephants to legal hunting and um, problem animal control by authorities than, than poaching. This kind of conflict is elephants raiding farmers' croplands, um, and wandering into areas that conflict with, with commercial interest and such like. Um, there's also numerous rescues of young calves and other distressed elephants from free ranging populations in this, in this area. So the reality is it's likely there's always gonna be elephants in human care. And it really is our duty to ensure that duty of care is taken seriously and can evolve towards being the best it can be. Giving those refugees from the Anthropocene, and that's what many of these elephants are, they're 
they're simply refugees from a situation imposed upon them by humanity, the best life that, that they can possibly have. You know, there's no true, no truly wild space left that modern man has not impacted in some degree, both globally through climate change and biodiversity loss and locally through pollution, development and a desire to satisfy human needs and desires, which always trump other motivations, unfortunately. This here is a, is a fence that was around, that is around an airport. It's been fixed since then, but this damage was done by an elephant. Um, and once an elephant is on a runway, that caused a big safety issue. So the, pro the authorities have the right then to shoot that elephant, use lethal problem animal control. Now, I'm actually happy to say in this particular instance, the elephant concerned, um, we were involved with non-lethal control. Um, we um, got the elephant out of there and there, uh, uh, alongside other, um, other organizations um, who know a lot about this in, in the Victoria Falls area, uh, we were able to put a collar on and we now track that elephant's movements. And I'm glad to say touch wood, he's not been back to the airport. Although he has proved to be uh, uh, an, uh, an elephant that, that crops raids, um, raids crops, beg your pardon. So we really need to get this right for the welfare of individuals in human care, but also the conservation of the species overall. So how do we do this? So through a series of workshops um, that uh, we performed over the last three or four years in Zimbabwe, Zambia and Southern Africa, South Africa, the need for standards was agreed amongst three key stakeholder groups. The need for standards for welfare management of elephants in human care. So these, these stakeholder groups included the experts, so these are conservation and welfare experts, uh, including international ethologists, welfare scientists, conservationists, wildlife veteran, uh, veterinarians and ethicists, local animal welfare professionals, these include veterinarians, local welfare NGOs, um, um, and the elephant facilities themselves. These guys obviously have the responsibility for the day-to-day -day care of these elephants in and these include tourism operations and uh, release programs. So getting all these people together and discussing these issues was actually quite easy as there was clearly an interest and a need to do something. We did some fundraising through crowdfunding platforms to support the workshops and, uh, and we were oversubscribed and that lent, meant that we could then register the charity We Are All Mammals in the UK. Um, and the phrase We Are All Mammals actually came from a vet um, uh, who attended one of our early workshops. The mission of We Are All Mammals is to promote through education, research and knowledge sharing mutually beneficial relationships between mammals and humans. And WAM's first, or We Are All Mammals, shorten, uh, shortened to WAM, first major project is to act as a vehicle through which we could drive forward the standards for animal welfare management of elephants in human care in Southern Africa. And we currently are raising front funds for this project to help us over the final hurdles into the implementation stage. Um, so please donate if you feel inclined to do so. So for myself, uh, particularly, I, I, I became the driver of this initiative uh, and under the gu guidance of the WAM trustees and others, um, I became aware that I was simply an animal psychologist through these, through these um, workshops, someone who just parachutes in and tells everyone how they should be teaching their animals and how to improve the welfare of them without having on the ground responsibility for the actual animals. So as these trips developed, I, I became aware that what I really needed to do was understand the limitations 
of caring for these elephants in the countries I was visiting to drive this process forward. Africa is an amazing, wonderful human place full of the most delightful people you'll ever meet uh, and, and the absolute best for, my, for me personally, wonders of the natural world. But it also can be an unforgiving and difficult place to operate due to access to resources, economics, the climate, and there are cultural differences that need to be understood too. Also, in general, the management of elephants in human care is very different from Africa to Asia. Most facilities are based on large game reserves and Zebuact herd has access to about 3,000 hectares, which is, which is quite a large area for, for, for the number of elephants we have. They're generally housed in some form of night um, accommodation for their own protection and management reasons, um, but have most of the day to, free roly, uh, to roam freely browsing in their natural habitat, generally are seen by carers for their safety and for that of others. You know, a lot of these areas um, have people, just random members of the public passing through who live one side of the game park and want to get to the other. Um, and, uh, you know, people live side by side with elephants here. You, you know, the Victoria Falls town regularly has elephants just wandering through the center of the town. So, um, so we have to be wary of that. Um, and, um, you know, there, there isn't barriers everywhere between elephants and humans. They're just in the same space. But humans are also increasingly encroaching on what were traditionally elephant ranges and, and corridors and routes that elephants would take um, un uninterrupted. So following on for this, the opportunity came up for me to manage a group of elephants at ZWAC, the Zambezi Elephant Welfare and Conservation Trust. Um, the owners of these elephants, Shearwater Adventures, had decided to take a new direction um, by putting them under the guardianship of a charitable trust rather than maintaining them as assets to a commercial operation. Um, and uh, I must thank Shearwater for having the courage to pursue this path. So I've ended up with a dual role of driving forward standards for the welfare and management of elephants in human care and actually managing a herd of elephants. Um, one has actually been released uh, because we came to the decision that was the right thing to do for that elephant. So we certainly um, aren't restricted in our belief about what these elephants can do. We look to them to be guided by them about what the best thing for them um, given our knowledge of wider issues around our elephant conservation and their, and their behavior. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident uh, and happy to say that I genuinely believe that with a bit of thought, care and understanding, it really is possible to develop and work towards a really high quality of life for elephants in similar situations. And uh, as the last year has proved, you can do that on a meager budget if, if, if you're very careful as well. Ideally not on a meager budget and that's, um, that's the benefit of tourism. It can, uh, it can allow you to do, why, do more things um, because of, 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 the, of the money that it does bring in. So I hope that can be reflected in the final draft of the first version of our standards which will be out later this year and really look forward to working with all the organizations and individuals who participated to implement these standards. We have come a long way in the last 50 years in how to understand, interact and care for other individuals of other individuals of other species through science and practice. And given the world's two biggest environmental challenges climate change and biodiversity loss, we need to meet these challenges in new and adaptive ways. Both humans and other species concerned have to be included in these solutions too. All life is by its nature adaptive and evolving. 
through understanding other species and individuals, we have the opportunity to evolve our relationship with them for mutual benefit. Elephants are particularly adaptive and their behaviors in the wild or in human care are constantly evolving, in part in both situations due to human activities. Helping find a place for these species into a future and progressing our knowledge of these other intelligent, emotional, sentient beings. And why is it important that we interact with and look towards a common future for us and other mammals? Well, as David Attenborough puts it, cherish the natural world because you're part of it and you depend on it. For, be, for me being situated here, I'm at the center of the lar largest free roaming population of elephants left on this planet, the last great elephant range. And I see elephants on a daily basis th that are both looked after by us, but are also wild. Uh, I, I even find that uh, I, I have a rather expensive pot part habit because elephants often come and eat all the plants off my veranda. And the, so the challenges these elephants are facing and will face increasingly as human populations expand in this part of the world, I think having the opportunity to appreciate these am amazing iconic creatures is key to helping them into the future. It is through the huge depths of understanding that we can plumb by caring for elephants that need our help studying them, educating others about them and their intrinsic value that we can help them progress into the future with us. I think research is key and tourism can also be a vital tool. If done thoughtfully, tourism provides education, inspiration, reaching people who might not otherwise care or might not otherwise have the opportunity. As long as the elephants involved lead a high quality of life, Tourism can be a hugely important conduit for conservation welfare. Finally, by saying that elephants or other species must only live in the wild, a wild that is diminishing at an eye-watering speed, are we not denying them other experiences and potentially a viable future? As one of the tr trustees of We Are All Mammals, Professor Christine Nichol says, don't you think that elephants, elephants get anything out of that connection with humans too. Well, I've come to the end now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna hand back to John. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, if I can. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Jake. Um, Brilliant. Uh, I, I, um, you've, you've picked my wanderlust once again. I, I haven't yet managed to visit you. I've been promising for a while. Um, you've been to see us here. Um, I really, yeah. I really do hope I can get to Vic Falls sooner rather than later because then, uh, yeah, as I say, I think you've, you've described it so well. And obviously, I'm eager to see your work as well. But the, the idea of seeing wild elephants and elephants on runways, it's been, been a while since I've managed to make it into any form of wild elephant territory. It would be lovely to come in come and see you in, in Victoria Falls. Um, so I don't think we actually have any questions on the on the Facebook, um, but if anybody does have questions, could they could they leave them here? Um, and if not uh, on the Zoom, uh, I think we have your mother online. I'm sure she has a question or two. And uh, and Kate, does, if anybody would like anyone on the Zoom would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, they're more than welcome. Mm. Hi. <laughs> hey, hey, okay. Jake. Um, am I audible? Okay. Yeah. That was you absolutely are, yes. brilliant. Thank you so much. And hello, John. Um, I totally agreed with your conclusion that actually having experience of elephants has to be key to figuring out ways to move forward with them. I think there's another David Attenborough quote you could nab at the end there. That thing about um, we'll never protect what we don't love and we never love what we don't experience. So, yeah, very powerful conclusion. Thank you. I was just wondering. In the, ter in the terms of um, giving ele elephants in semi-captivity or captivity the highest possible love, what have you found to be the biggest barriers? And I was thinking in two directions there. I mean, elephants in, in the wild roam a lot, don't they? How important is big spaces to elephants? 
And then I was also imagining that perhaps you're going to say, well, really, it's it's the people that that become the biggest challenge to the elephants and people's lack of understanding. But but can you be kind of unpack that a bit? If, if we're working with elephants in captivity or semi-captivity, what are the biggest challenges to creating a very high quality of life? Yeah, sure. Thank thank you, Kate. And I, I should probably should say that Kate and I know know each other from uh, from some uh, time ago. Um, <laughs> I um, what are the biggest challenges to, to improving their lives so I, I kind of I think yes you know always when working with any animal it's the humans you've got to teach it's not the animal mm. at the end of the day it's the humans they've got to understand be able to understand their animals better and and try and communicate better with them um, uh, and um, be able to give them the lives that they are showing them that they want um, so that that obviously is a big part which you preempted me on. Um, I think space is quite important for elephants. Mm. They are big animals. They do need space to roam around in. Um, they are physical animals. As I said, they have a huge cerebellum. That must mean that they really need to experience things physically. Um, and that means they need to also do physical things and have the opportunity to do physical things. Um, and I know that one um, one of the things that I've come across in, in, in conversations with with John um, is that in Thailand, places where they've moved away from elephant rides, actually there's other phys there's other physical welfare issues that the elephants have then experienced because they're not getting that physical exercise. Um, so I'm not I'm not I'm certainly not um, advocating riding. I I think that's um, that's a different argument but what I'm saying is that they they do need space to move around in um they they need um you know I think uh, generally it's considered that elephants can move between 10 and 30 kilometers a day in Africa mm. um they need uh they need stuff to fiddle with and play with like I said their trunks are full of muscles and they do so much investigation of the world with their trunks. They, 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 um, they, they, and the majority of that time it's browsing or grazing. So they're, they're, they're getting food by tugging at things and pulling at branches. And so, yeah, I mean, one of the things we do, for instance, in, in their nighttime areas, um, we uh, ensure that we provide them with cut browse. So that gives them something to do overnight. Um, it's not just about the food aspect of it, it's about the manipulation aspect as well. Um, and then I think it's really about, I think, I think one of the biggest barriers, and I think this is a challenge for a lot of places that, 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 that call themselves sanctuaries, is, is that there is inevitably going to be some form of human um interaction with with animals in those situations because they've had the you know they've had imposed upon them a fence they can't get through that fence and in, inevitably there's going to be have to be some form of management from humans and if you want those animals to be happy in that enclosure you've got to have them be happy with the presence of the humans that are attending them so so they really that that is a really important thing for those animals. Otherwise, often in those situations, the only social interaction those animals get will be those other humans. And if that's not a positive um, experience, then, I mean, that's like being locked up in a cell with a really mean jail guard. So I think, you know, that, I mean, that's a little bit emotive, but I, I, I think that, that relationship really is, that is, that is important. Um, so I think those are my that, those those that's what I sort of give you my answer there. No, oh, thanks, Jake. That's yeah, that really makes a lot of sense. I have a bonus yes. question if nobody else has. No, go ahead, Kate. Go. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, my my second question when I was hearing you speak was I was wondering about the extent to which the whole culture of conservation more widely is still very species focused. 
because I remember when I was researching for my PhD a long time ago now, I was really interested in the relationship between conservation and environmentalism at the kind of species level, and then the focus on animal welfare. And there was often a really unexpected clash I found between those two big movements, the animal welfare movement and the conservation movement. And at that point, conservationists, not always, but in many cases, were somewhat dismissive about the individual as a, as a important site of value. And I wonder to what extent you found that's changed with the rise of compassionate conservation and, and other kind of movements trying to address that. Uh, has it completely gone or is there still um, a bit of that residue of that old thinking that it's the species that matters and too much concern for the individual is just a bit sentimental and not very scientific, uh, which definitely used to be an attitude, as you know. Yeah, I'm hoping you can say it's gone. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could. I'm sorry, I can't. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of that sentiment is still deeply rooted in, in a lot of conservation efforts across mm. Africa. Um, you know, I, I know that, and I don't know if the IUCN have changed this now, but I do remember in one of their sort of release policy documents, there was a, there was a, uh, and I, I, I'm not getting the correct wording here, but there was a line saying, a release must be um, for the benefit of the conservation of the species and not necessarily for the benefit of the individual, mm. which is exactly what welfare is all about, as you rightly point out, it's about the individual. Um, so I'd like to say that it's changing. I think it is. And I think, I think many of the new, newer people coming into the sort of conservation space um, do understand that a bit better. Um, I think older people, <laughs> some, you know, the more open-minded at least, their, their attitudes are changing. Um, um, I think, you know, I think one of the tricky things to get over, one of the tricky hurdles to get over is really where the funding comes from mm. in conservation. Mm. And, and at the moment, you know, if you come up with a big anti-poaching initiative, you'll get loads of money. But if you come up with an initiative that's about studying the welfare of a wild herd of elephants, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna have your work cut out for you. So it's, um, you know, it's unfortunate that that's the way the things are. And I just hope that as time goes on, people will value those projects that focus on animal welfare more because animal, mm. animal welfare is intrinsic to the health of wild populations. You know, it's a great indicator of whether that is a healthy population in a balanced ecosystem. Um, and if you start seeing a lot of deaths, a lot of illness, then there's some kind of welfare issue likely to be at the root of it. Great, thank you, Jake. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, and tell me about it. We, we actually, it's not a welfare project that we're helping fund, but it's a, it's a behavioural observation of, of wild of wild species here in uh, here or wild elephants here in uh, here in Thailand. And yes, getting getting funding. Actually, we're one of the funders. We're not the primary investigators, but getting getting funding for it um, has been has been very difficult. Um, and yes, the anti poaching stuff is 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 much easier to do because it's it's kind of sexy. Um, the other, the, the one thing that I thought that fascinated me, actually, I learned from from the talk, which we may act, we, we may implement here, is the idea of actually walking around an elephant every morning and, and naming its body parts for it. Um, I just just thought I'd bring that up. It's something that, of course, because we do the target training, we know elephants can learn leg, we know they can learn hand, which is the word we use for the front feet. And we, we actually had one elephant who, oh, I, I, unfortunately, the team aren't with me today, but they had a. Um, She'd already been trained on side, so we had to use flank and everything else. But it, but it actually would be very interesting to get the mahouts to go around and every day, it, yes, do the touching as part of bonding, because of course they do that when they when they when they bathe the elephants and everything else. But also to, when, while they do it, name the body parts. It might make a might make the target training and all the other trainings go a lot easier. So fascinating to hear about that. Maybe we should. Uh, but next, when I come and visit, I will I will video it. Okay, yeah. I think. If there are no other questions, um, then I will say thank you very, very much for it. A, a brilliant talk, uh, Jake. Uh, 
absolute pleasure to talk to you always. Some, some great ideas in there as well. Um, I will rewatch the, uh, I will rewatch it and re replay the video with my team and, uh, and, and a great addition to our training series, which I'm now going to call it, but as you say, Gerardo and Dr. Andrew and yourself, um, we really, we really are covering some of the, the newer and more thoughtful aspects of training elephants. Um, and I love the way you bring the emotional side into it as well, rather more than, than the others who do. And, uh, and talk about the, the elephant as an individual. And again, going all the way back to what you said in the beginning, but everybody talks about animals being, being unpredictable or animals not having individual personality and then goes back and says that they, tells you how much they love their cat and their cat loves them. Um, so yeah, fantastic <laughs> points. Okay, thank you very much everybody for joining and for watching. Um, I think I'm gonna be able to manage the morning lockdown live stream. Well, here we go, is that a question? Oh, somebody missed the start. That's okay. If you missed the start, we will place this on, we will leave it live on Facebook and we're going to put it on the YouTube channel. So there's plenty of chance to watch it later on for everybody who's watching. Indeed, all of the other lectures I'm talking talking about are still up there as well. So if you'd like to hear Andrew and Dr. Gerardo's or Dr. Andrew and Dr. Gerardo's talks, they're, they're there on the, on Facebook and on YouTube as well. So, so don't worry if you miss most of it. Sorry, we're a little slow in advertising this week. Um, Generally, our lockdown live stream, I think the morning was, well, the morning sessions will begin again tomorrow, the afternoon sessions, because we, are, we have a bit of a clash of, of schedules and we're doing virtual, virtual field trips into a, a London primary school at the live stream time. Uh, the afternoon sessions will start again next week, but um, live streams back tomorrow. Please do join us at 7.30 in the morning hour time. Probably no one actually alive, no one awake on this one, but never mind, I'll tell you. And um, yes, if you happen to be in Thailand, please do come and see us. We are open. We do have elephants here. Um, managed it with a lot of parallels. I think probably Jake, Jake, Jake does it a, a little bit differently in places, but there are a lot of parallels and a lot of things that we've learned from him and learned from other experts over the years. And come and see happy elephants in their in their natural habitat, which goes back to again what you were just saying about um, not only allowing them a, a wide range of food, but also the enrichment of, of actually being in their natural habitat and having to browse and feed. So if you're in Thailand, please do come and see us. Lots of thank yous coming up, but still no, still no questions. So, all that remains for me to say is thank you very much, um, Jake, for for the excellent lecture, and we will uh, see you. Well, see see you very soon when I can travel to Victoria Falls. See everybody else virtually um, tomorrow morning at seven thirty. Thank you. Very thank you, John. We look forward to uh, welcoming you here and anybody else that wants to come to Victoria Falls. Yes, yes. Did, did, can you can can tourists travel to Zimbabwe at the moment? Uh, they can, they can um, travel to Zimbabwe. Yes, we're, okay. It's one of the few, few business, few industries in in Zimbabwe that's allowed to be open. But um, I think things are easing up here a bit now. Is it anyway? Okay, great. So if you have the time and you can't get to Thailand, go to Zimbabwe. Go and visit. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you later on. Uh, oh, hold on a second. Did I stop recording? I didn't stop recording.